After six years of war, Canadians are enjoying peace and the promise of prosperity. But the shadow of a new war is approaching. In September 1945, a man goes to the offices of the Ottawa Journal. More than 100 secret documents stuffed under his clothing reveal a spy ring has been operating in Canada. The night editor is confronted by a cipher clerk from the Soviet embassy named Igor Guzenko. The first words he spoke were, it's war, it's Russia. <laughs> well, that didn't ring a bell with me because World War II was over and we were not at war with Russia. It takes 30 hours before Guzenko can convince anyone that his story is true and that he is in danger. This is Matthew Halton of the CBC, speaking from London. Almost everybody's interested in the big spy story from Canada. There's a wild flood of wild rumors coming over the cables, mostly from Washington, as if somebody were trying to start a witch hunt. Five months later, RCMP agents in Ottawa and Montreal seized 13 people suspected of giving information to Russia, information that might even include the secret of the atom bomb. The suspects include civil servants, scientists, even a member of parliament. Eventually, 20 people are sent to trial. Nine are acquitted. Fred Rose, Canada's only communist MP, is convicted of spying for the Soviets. They will spend the rest of their lives under suspicion, their reputations tarnished. Igor Guzenko is given refuge in Canada. His revelations signal the beginning of another very different war. And for Canada, geography will once again determine destiny. This is the story of a nation reborn through the dreams of a generation who sacrificed everything on the battlefields of the world, of the dispossessed who come seeking freedom and fortune. of a colony that becomes a province and completes a country. A time of plenty, not shared by all, and a peace burdened with dread. Out of the fires of one war, Canada will be caught in the icy grasp of another. It is the story of a nation caught between comfort and fear. For millions of European refugees, the Second World War is not yet over. They have lost jobs, homes, families, but not hope. They seek escape from devastation in Canada. Canada does not want Europe's dispossessed, but its farms and factories need cheap labor. Government officials prefer brawn to brains in filling bulk orders for workers. Refugees' hands are examined for calluses. 
Jan Saremba spent the war in a German POW camp. Now he rescues his wife and children from Soviet-occupied Poland. He lies about his law degree to better their chance at freedom. I had discovered that when one must get a job, higher education is definitely against one. I just wanted to look like a, a good, strong man who would do well any job I was given. I knew I could not be a lawyer. George Luke, an Estonian engineer, and his wife Gertie are also seeking refuge for their family. For Gertie Luke, Canada is a land where there is no fear. The greatest day of our lives was when George finally got a visa to Canada. You do not have to be afraid that someone will turn you into the authorities for something you might say. In April 1948, the SS Marine Falcon leaves Germany for Halifax. On board are Jan and Alina Zaremba and their two children, Basha and Matja. Jan has been admitted to work in a Quebec textile mill. Alina as a domestic servant. Engineer George Luke comes to mine gold in Northern Ontario. But for him, as with the other displaced people of Europe, the mere sight of Canada represents a miraculous escape from darkness. I have a feeling I can do anything here. Anything can happen. It is a little like being a child with faith again. But as Alina Zaremba discovers, there are obstacles for people Canadians brand as DPs. What precisely do Canadians think DPs are? Sometimes I feel as though we were expected to be some new strange species. Sometimes I feel that people forget we did live quite normal, quite ordinary lives before the war. The biggest thing will be to be normal people again, to forget we are numbers, to forget we are DPs. George Luke journeys on to the gold mines, but he is an untalented miner. When Gertie and his daughters join him a year later, George has a new job as a chemical engineer with Imperial Oil in Sarnia. Gertie becomes a doctor. Together, the Lukes build a new life as Canadians. The best of it is, today, the bread we eat, we earn. We have left behind the DP status. We are free men in charge of our own lives. It is good to greet each new morning as individuals, as ordinary human beings. Over the next 15 years, Canada admits two million people. 165,000 of them are displaced people. But not everyone is welcome. Despite the horrors of the concentration camps, half of all Canadians oppose any Jewish immigration to Canada. Few are admitted. In Canada, the war's end does not mean the promise of freedom to all of its citizens. Sashiko Ohata has spent a third of her life in a camp in British Columbia's interior. Although the war is over, the federal government will not allow Japanese Canadians to remain in British Columbia. They must choose either another relocation east of the Rockies or exile in Japan. Feeling betrayed by their country and fearing continued persecution, 
the Ohata family reluctantly makes its choice. My mom and dad waited until the last possible minute before signing that form. They didn't want to go to Japan, especially mother. None of us wanted to go. More than 4,000 quit Canada. Most are Canadian citizens. The Ohatas join the last boatload of exiles sailing for Japan. At their ancestral home outside Hiroshima, they are shocked by the destruction and destitution. Sashiko's mother develops pleurisy and dies. For Sashiko, Japan is a foreign land. It will take her 10 years before she finally manages to return to the only place she has ever called home. I had a tiny vanity case and kept packing and unpacking it. I had so few belongings. I really wanted to go back. At my farewell party, I started singing, Oh Canada. I remembered all the words. To get back, we did it all ourselves. Doesn't that mean that we really loved Canada? In December of 1945, a former journalist, union organizer, and failed pig farmer named Joseph Robert Smallwood contemplates his uncertain future. A headline catches his eye that will change his life and the map of Canada forever. Great Britain, anxious to lighten its financial burden, is ready to restore self-government to its colony of Newfoundland. We all love this land. It has a charm. It warms our hearts, go where we will. A charm, a magic, a mystical tug on our emotions that never dies. With all her faults, we love her. In St. John's, Smallwood becomes a delegate to the convention debating Newfoundland's future. For most, there is only one choice, nationhood. Then Smallwood makes a startling proposal, union with Canada instead. Under Confederation, we would be better off in pocket, in stomach, and in health. For the first time in Newfoundland's history, Newfoundland's people would have a chance to live. The war has eased Newfoundland's poverty, but incomes are still only a third of those in Canada. Canada's new social programs could mean the difference between comfort and want. Many in the outport support Smallwood's call for union with the richer country. Fanny Ryan Fyander of Harbour Grace is not among them. The 60-year-old mother and poet leaves her sickbed to fight for independence. I had to give my lip support to strengthen it as it was temporarily paralyzed, but I persevered. No surrender. The freedom of our land comes before everything else. Newfoundland is still our own dear land and we are as yet Newfoundlanders and not Canadians. Smallwood proposes a delegation be sent to Ottawa to discuss what financial assistance Canada might offer Newfoundland. Great Britain and Canada both fear the strategically placed Newfoundland could fall into American hands. They support Confederation. When Ottawa pledges financial help, Smallwood is elated. St. John's powerful merchant class is not. They fear union with Canada will reduce their power and their pocketbooks. Their leader, Peter Cashin, brands Smallwood a traitor. I say to you that there is in operation at the present time a conspiracy to sell 
and I use the word sell advisedly, this country to the Dominion of Canada. Newfoundlanders must decide their future to remain a colony, become a nation, or join Canada. They choose nationhood, but not with a majority. They must vote again. Don't vote confederation. And that's my prayer to you. We owns the house we lives in. Likewise, our schooner too. But if you heed your small words, Canadian patois, you'll be always paying taxes to the tribe up in Ottawa. Confederation's opponents have sentiment on their side. Smallwood has cash. He raises money through the advance sale of seats in the Canadian Senate. Canadian companies also provide generous donations. Towns, neighbors, families divide into hostile camps. Irish Catholics battle English Protestants. Outports versus St. John's. Smallwood tells Newfoundland they must choose between irrelevance and the 20th century. We are not a nation. We are a medium-sized municipality. We can, of course, persist a dot on the shore of North America. By our isolation, we have been left far behind in the march of time. The sport of historic misfortune, the Cinderella of empire. Days before the second and deciding vote, Fanny Ryan Fyander makes a last appeal. If self-government is the highest expression of our race, then what is the lowest expression of our race? Is it to deliberately scrap our constitution for a mess of pottage? All eyes are on us. On July 22nd, the nations of the world will either deem us conquerors or cowardly. On July 22, 1948, the voters of Newfoundland break Fanny Ryan Fyander's heart. Confederation wins with 52% of the vote. On March 31, 1949, Newfoundland officially joins Canada. There is celebration in the outports for Canada's newest province and mourning in St. John's for their lost nation. On Parliament Hill, the ceremony in honor of the newly completed country is presided over by a new prime minister, Louis Saint Laurent. It is my hope and belief that in the future, the advantages of the Union will be increasingly recognized by the great majority of the people of Newfoundland and of all Canada. Joseph Robert Smallwood's future is no longer uncertain. He becomes the last father of Confederation and the new province's first premier. The tumult of war has unleashed a thirst for freedom. Quebec's rigidly conservative society is assailed by artists, intellectuals, and workers. A modern Quebec is emerging. Painters like Paul-Emile Bourdois embrace abstract expressionism, a celebration of spontaneity and emotion. A group of artists around Bourdois publish a manifesto called Refus Global. It is a revolt against Quebec's traditional values. To hell with the holy water sprinkler and the French Canadian Duke. The reign of our fear is over. Fear of prejudice, fear of public opinion, of persecution, of general disapproval. Fear of the established order, fear of absurd laws, blue fear. Red fear, white fear, so many links to our chains. 
Make way for magic. Make way for love. The cry for change is greeted with scorn from the establishment. Bortois is fired from his teaching position. He will leave Quebec forever. Workers, too, are demanding change. In 1949, the greatest challenge to the rule of Quebec's elites comes from the asbestos pits of the eastern townships. Rodolphe Amel leads the mine workers' union. People had always endured working conditions that bordered on slavery, and the favoring of English workers who made up about 10% of the workforce. Everything was done in English. The English had all the best jobs. After that, French Canadians were hired as white Negroes to fill the gaps. In February, 5,000 miners in the towns of Asbestos and Tetford Mines walk out. They are demanding a wage increase of 15 cents an hour and protection from deadly asbestos dust. The American-owned company Johns Manville has an ally in the powerful and deeply conservative Premier of Quebec, Maurice Duplessis. The system of an enterprise private, which is the seul qui convient à nos aspirations. Duplessis believes Quebec's prosperity rests on giving capitalists a free hand, no matter what their language. The strike becomes a rallying call for Quebec unionists and intellectuals. Gérard Pelletier is a reporter with Montreal's Le Devoir. In the official ideology of the time, there was simply no place for the working class. Factory workers were seen as intruders. They had the bad taste to exist. Pelletier meets an old friend, a fiery labor leader named Jean Marchand. They are joined by a third man. It's time now to learn democracy from the grassroots and a 29-year-old lawyer named Pierre Elliott Trudeau. His presence is electrifying. The striking miners nickname him Saint Joseph, but when he took the floor at a meeting, they listened to him very attentively. He knew how to speak on matters of justice, democracy, and freedom in a way that was highly relevant to the situation. Duplessis likes to boast that the province's bishops eat out of his hand. But some Catholic clergy defy him by taking up collections for impoverished strikers. On May 1, 1949, the Archbishop of Montreal, Monsignor Joseph Charbonneau, delivers a fateful sermon. In the splendor of Notre Dame Basilica, he denounces the power of the capitalists. When there is a conspiracy to crush the working class, the church has a duty to intervene. We value people more than capital. It is an astonishing break in the ranks of the ruling order. At asbestos, strikers attack police when they try to bring strike breakers into the blockaded mines. An enraged Premier Duplessis has had enough. This is about an admitted attempt, encouraged from outside, to challenge and break the state's authority. That is intolerable! He sends in his personal police force. 400 heavily armed provincial police arrive at daybreak. Some strikers seek refuge in a church, but there is no safety there. Others are rousted from their homes. Alphonse Valéard is taken and locked in a small room. When two policemen arrive, the interrogation begins. I told them that the cops fired at us yesterday. 
One of them called me a liar. He pounces and curses me, hits me in the side of the mouth with his fist. While I was trying to protect my face, the other one hit me across the ribs with his nightstick. Dozens of miners are brutally beaten. Others are arrested and jailed. Archbishop Charbonneau is forced to resign and spends the rest of his life as a hospital chaplain in Victoria, British Columbia. After five months, the strike ends with few gains for the miners. But Quebec's old order has been shaken. The seeds for a new era have been sown. February 13, 1947, Imperial Oil drills a last chance hole in a farmer's field near Edmonton. The company has drilled 133 holes in the west, all of them dry. If number 134 is dry as well, Imperial Oil will pull out of Canada. The pushing sound you just heard was the Imperial Oil Limited number one well at Leduc, Alberta, coming into production. The oil started flowing under its own pressure at 4 o'clock this afternoon, Thursday, February 13th, what may be a momentous occasion in the oil world. This is Al Yerksa of CJCA Edmonton. A tide of oil transforms Alberta's economy, reshapes the nation, and changes the way Canadians live. By 1950, there is more oil exploration and development in Canada than anywhere else in the world. 30 years earlier, Frank McMahon had set out to make his fortune in oil and gas. Now he joins the scramble. There's no doubt about it, we are in an oil boom. I've seen a few, but none as big as...